So, um, let's see. Uh, I don't know. We don't. So, Dorothy's here. Uh, Craig Conrad is out of town, as is Chris Hamilton. Um, Jack Hatter is at his child's concert, and we'll be. Yes, he'll be, he'll be a little late. Um, Who is taking notes today? Jay. Okay, so um, so let's get started. Um, so we're doing what the committee is supposed to be doing, which is gathering information, and we're just basically, I think, uh, we're going to be sharing the information we're gather, gathering. These, none of this is, is complete, or at least I should say from the point of view of the experts, who I've been more closely working with. Dorothy's been working with uh, the users and helping them uh, develop their questionnaire, etc. So, um, so I just wanted to say um, again, thank you, everybody. Um, I, I'm, I, as I said in my email, there's a lot of interest in the work that we're doing. That there, people are going to get more interested as as time goes by. I'm sure. Um, and one of the things I'm hearing is. Uh, just appreci appreciation that we're working together as well as we are and um, you know people want that basically um, in, in spite of our former some of our former differences um, so the agenda uh, you've seen the agenda I don't know if there's anything missing um, we can just Maybe at the end, see if there's anything after the uh, before the assignments, just any other issues that we want to think about, um, if there's anything else to discuss. Uh, is there anything like some egregious thing that we've missed um, that in terms of reviewing the agenda? Does anybody have anything to say on that? Jay, I got something from you, and I couldn't see anything. I wasn't quite sure what it was. Did, Maybe it was, was just a noti notification. I wasn't quite sure what it was. Yeah, I think it was a notification. I was, I was oh. putting okay. spaces on there. Okay, okay. I wasn't sure if there was something. I, I looked and I couldn't find anything else. So. Okay. Um, so, um, just to say in terms of what has happened in the last month, um, Dorothy's worked with uh, the faculty and staff um, to put together a questionnaire. Um, staff, it looks like, has participated, I don't know, pretty fully, is that true, Megan? And yeah. so the answer, the questionnaires. Um, and uh, so, so that's going to be information that's very important. It's not enough to kind of look at the system, you've got to know how they're functioning, and by, you know, so the users are, have close at hand information about that. Um, the experts, we've spent some time in the high school. Um, looking at systems again we didn't talk to any of the users over there today uh, we spent time here basically on this hall and we three of the teachers were there which was really great we talked to um, Ms. Sims, Ms. Denman and Ms. Mabra um, so it was really and oh and um, Ms. Hoover. Who? Ms. Hoover. Ms. Hoover yes yeah so they were able to tell us, you know, they were still doing after school work. They were able to talk to us about, you know, some of the challenges of the, in their rooms. And, and that was really great to have those conversations. Um, so let's start. So Dorothy has put together a PowerPoint in terms of information gathered from the survey. And I'm going to let her okay. uh, start. So I actually have two PowerPoints, and they are 60 slides. It would take us a long time to go through them. And I think that everybody would burn out on that. So um, even though I'm putting it here, it's because I'm going to use it in a few minutes. What I wanted to start with first is that I've written about 15 minutes worth of my takes from the survey answer. And then we can do questions if the builders have or even users. And I can try to point out to where I have relevant information on the slides. I also want to point out that Hineda and Brian were uh, persons of contacts in their buildings for uh, staff members that wanted to give anonymous uh, answers, so to uh, provide more comments in a non-identifiable way. So at some point, I'll make sure that you have um, time to go through this. Um, so like 
uh, Judith pointed out we got a great completion rate of the survey. Uh, I didn't put it together, but I believe Dr. Holden that you said it was near everyone filled it up. It was, yes. Near everyone filled it up, uh, okay. Yeah. And so I wanted to thank the users, I mean, especially those that are here, but also the ones that might be watching this uh, for taking the time to provide us with that wealth of information on the state of their classroom and their building and on the grounds. I want to apologize in advance because I'm not going to be able to go and cover and acknowledge all of the comments that were given. There was just so much. Um, so I'm just giving an, an overview here, but I want uh, the users to know that I've read all of them and that they're being shared with the whole group. And a lot of really good information. A lot of good information. Yeah, great. And uh, so this committee has access to the raw data of this, which includes the name of teachers. And so I'm asking you for now that, until I have time to go in and take the names of teachers and just leave the room numbers, that we do not share this until I have time to take it out. I, because it wasn't clear to the users that they were gonna be tied to their name and I don't want to put them in an awkward situation here. Uh, the other disclaimer I'm going to give is that I'm going to make reference to the dilapidated and sometimes unclean state of the buildings in the comments. And it was clear from the data that uh, the users, even though they mentioned this, uh, they never put it, they never phrased it as a lack of maintenance or a lack of custodial work, if anything they were pointing out that those items were reaching their life cycles and they were just too hard to maintain, or too hard to repaint, uh, too, too, um, too hard to maintain and to repair. So this is really not a reflection at least from what I've gathered from the nuances of the answers on the lack of maintenance or procedural work, it's more like those items are uh, worn out. Okay, so I will start with the strength that I've seen in the answers. What are the strengths of our buildings? Well, the first one was really the views and access to daylight. This seems to be pretty clear from the users that they appreciated having green space around. They appreciated having enough daylight. And there is one exception to this. It's in this building, it's room nine, because they're hidden from the daylight by the trailer. And they don't have access to it. Uh, the strength also so the green spaces um, and that comes with a caveat that I'm going to cover later in it's great that there is green space and trees but there is a downside to uh, the proximity and the use by the community of those green space and I'm going to cover that too uh, the background noise seems manageable at Millsone except for classrooms near the trailer I'm sorry Brian <laughs> And also, the parking lot seems to be uh, deemed to be sufficient in capacity, in proximity, and in condition. Um, so those were the, the main strength that I got from the users. I'm going to switch now to one area of issue that I just, I'm summarizing under health issues. The first one is so many users reported leaky ceilings, mold and mildew in both buildings. Um, they reported mold and mildew smells coming from permanent fixtures in the classroom, such as the cabinets and uh, any, any other things like that. And especially from the 1952 wing in this building. Um, the other health issue that was reported is stagnant air. And even if we set COVID aside, and I think that COVID has really put the finger on the need for ventilation. Even if we set the, the, the COVID aside, we need to also reckon with the fact that stagnant air is a contributing factor to childhood asthma, and childhood asthma is the leading cause of chronic absenteeism in schools nowadays. And even if we decide to set aside COVID and asthma, uh, we know by studies that the buildup of CO2 leads to lower academic performance. So we have here so many reasons to consider increasing air exchange as a priority for our buildings. I see that everybody is taking notes, I appreciate that. Um, another health issue that was reported is pests. And when we're talking about pests, we're talking about termites in both buildings. Ants, bats, mice, rats, snakes, wasps. Uh, and mostly because of uh, the lack of screens on the windows. So if 
uh, teachers are trying to ventilate the rooms when they, they let in pests. But mice and snakes, I don't even don't want to think about it. There are also spiders, and as an arachnophobic person, I'm not going to talk about it. Thank you very much. Okay, so those, those, this is what I summarized under health issue. The other component or category of comments that I've seen was about safety and security. Um, overall, users did not feel safe in the event of an active shooter. Um, there were several reasons that they listed here. Uh, it's how the entrances open to hallways and how there's no vestibules. Um, that was one reason, both at Mills Lawn and the high school and middle school, there was an exception is that the teachers that say that they felt safe were the one in the shoebox uh, to the high school because they're in the back and there was no direct access to it. Um, users were asking uh, about a closed front door vestibule in both buildings. And even if we set aside the possibility of active shooters, the vestibules were still mentioned as needed to handle other situations such as students attempting to leave the premises um, undetected, and also custody disputes and other scenarios like this where we need to have um, administrators and uh, a front person that are uh, being able to see who comes in and out. The person in Milsland that is taking care of opening the front door with a camera mentioned that she couldn't see what people had in their hands. And so she has, by her camera view, she can only see maybe the face and she doesn't see what they carry and what they have in hands, which we can probably improve on that as we should. Um, teachers and users mentioned the need for cameras around entrances and in the, in the hallways. The other uh, comment for safety and security is the fact that so many doors inside do not lock from the inside and open outwards. Mm -hmm. And so if there is an intruder in the building, there is very limited resources for them to block entrance into their classroom. Well, the doors open out would generate a safety issue. Yeah, for because fire. They're, because they're, yeah, for, for fire. fire. They're yeah. supposed to open out. And, uh, and so, uh, but then the question is intruders. Right, they wouldn't be able to block the door. Uh, at least that's what they said. Uh, another uh, safety and security issue that was reported was the fact that they couldn't hear emergency announcements. So first, there are some rooms that don't have the emergency announcement speakers, uh, such as the staff lounge, lounge in other areas. But also, for most of the other users, is the fact that the HVAC is so loud that they cannot hear the announcements. Uh, some people say that they could not, they have to leave their classrooms to have phone conversations because the HVAC is so loud. So this is the kind of ambient noise that they constantly have to deal with in periods when the HVAC is running. Um, some users offered really um, innovative solutions such as, or, or easy solutions such as uh, putting blinds on all the windows. So if you look on the map, sorry Jerry, I'm going to grab that. If you look here, all the classrooms that are here, they all have uh, floor-to-ceiling windows, and so they cannot hide if there is an active shooter on the outside wall. And so what they were asking for is, can we have blinds that covers that, that we can pull in blinds that work, because many blinds in those buildings are not working. Um, some of our users were asking about using walkie-talkies when they're on the playground and outside so that they can communicate with administrators on the inside if something is happening. Or if they need to send a child in, they could use that. So those are easy solutions that could be solving that. Uh, now in terms of severe weather events, at Mills Lawn, um, the users explained that they pile up everyone in the hallways, which is 370 kids in the hallways here, uh, which is very cramped in those uh, areas. Um, at the high school and middle school, they try to cram students in the basement. It cannot host everybody, and then the basement gets flooded. So this is not an adequate space to handle severe weather. Plus, it takes time to uh, go down from the tower into the basement, so there is just an issue of finding a safe uh, place for severe weather here. Is the basement the only place in the high school where people go? That's what they, that's what I gathered from the the answers, um, and and then yeah. yeah. What, what, what? I, I believe the uh, some of the administrative suite and then the room that Lori's in 
are on the inside of the hallway and are also in the line. Those are locations that we So it's the room 116 that you're talking, the ones rooms. without windows. So that's the theater room and then the administrator's office. If you so look up much, the probably. Yes, outside windows. Yeah. What about that inside the hallway? Right here, room 116. Mm -hmm. the part where is that? You know, oh. you've got the. Yeah. the um, I think there's windows and there's a the hallway and then there's. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's windows, windows, windows on the ends. Yeah. Yeah. But the basement, I want to point out, is, is really the boiler room. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's the yeah. boiler room. Yes. Um, and it's. Yes. So you're right. So uh, in addition of being a basement that floods and that doesn't have a capacity, it is a border room with me mechanical equipment. It's uh, tricky yes, to bring. <laughs> yes, it's tricky to uh, to bring safely kids in there. Which, which is the um, okay, another safety and security Correct. issue that was brought up. Uh, it's the need for dedicated safe spaces for individuals that are experiencing dysregulation. Okay, so that's a lot of words here, and I'm going to say that I got that one from participating to the Yellow Springs Speaking Up for Justice workshop that happened a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the need to have a space for students that experience a form of trauma, maybe a racist incident, a space where they can process and uh, if they are dysregulated. This is a question of safety and security for all, but there is also a question of equity in that. Uh, and then users reported experiencing electric shocks when switching off and on the lights. So it's, if you want to see which room, I'll let you look in the comments uh, in, the, in the user's response. So that was the safety, that was my summary of the safety and security here. I have another uh, category of comments which was on falling under basic comfort needs are not met. Uh, a users reported that students are wearing their coats inside the classroom because it's so cold in the winter, that is in the 1952 uh, era uh, of uh, Hillzone. And by the way, I, because I was unclear about which part were from where, you have in the yellow paper here, you have a map with the age of each part of the building. Uh, that was something. What I did is that when I looked at the response, I filtered out by age of a building so that I could see the trends between the 1952 and so forth. So the other basic comfort needs is that uh, even more so that it gets so cold that students have to wear coats is that it gets really hot, incredibly hot in there. More users reported that issue. Overall, they talked about the unreliability of the HVAC system and how it fed into other issues. So I really saw a, cir a vicious circle here, is that they're avoiding using the heat blowers of the AC units because they push dust out, because there is mold in there, because they're so loud. Uh, sometimes they bring their own portable heating and cooling devices, which puts a strain on the electric system. Some of them want to open windows to help with controlling the temperature, but they can't because either the windows don't open or they create new sorts of issues, like there's no screen, so they have bugs and pests coming in. So we seem to have, at, at the center of this, I see the HVAC as being the piece that creates other issues here. Uh, in terms of basic comfort needs, I saw a lot of comments about plumbing issues around the bathrooms and the restrooms here. Uh, so uh, someone reported the water backing up in their bathroom closet. Uh, many reported smells coming from the bathrooms and how it was permeating the classrooms nearby and then add heat to that and imagine what uh, the conditions are. Another, uh, another type of basic comfort needs that were not met was furnishing. Uh, there were talks about, someone wrote how they play a musical, musical chair in the high school because we do not have enough seating arrangements for all the students and they have some students that have to stay up from doing classes because they don't have enough. Um, some of us talked about how uh, tables were breaking as the students were taking tests. Many, many teachers talked about how they went scavenging at the Arthur Morgan Foundation to find tables and chairs for all their kids. Uh, many talked about the mismatch of tables uh, and chairs in their classrooms. 
And then the last, uh, the last basic comfort needs that were not met was connectivity issues at the high school. Uh, there are lots of spottiness in, uh, in getting to the internet and having it run, running smoothly to the point that some kids were losing connection during their tests, which is really tricky too. Another type of um, category or another, type of another group of comments that I've seen was the floor plan issues. Uh, and those, uh, I think, are very important because we may, we may consider that the buildings may be salvageable and we can renovate them, but if we have floor plan issues, then we're still not meeting all of the needs. So uh, a big theme was the lack of bathrooms or enough bathrooms in the tower at the high school. They don't have any bathrooms on the second and fourth floor. And they also have reduced capacity here in the 1957 wing. If you look at this, 1957 wings in uh, Mills Long, this was a theme too. Not enough bathroom for the staff. And all of that together, it's an equity issue for people who have reduced mobility. So let's say that someone that has reduced mobility is on the third floor. They have to take an elevator to go down. The elevator is also not entirely reliable, but it takes a long time for them to go meet a basic human need. And that means less instructional time. Um, so it's an equity issue for people with reduced mobility, but also people that are non-binary because they have to go find the non-binary bathroom that is on the other side of the building. Uh, it's also an equity issue for people who menstruate and for really anybody that has a human body and needs to go to the bathroom. Um, so the lack of bathrooms is a big floor plan issue here. The lack of space for private meetings, for counseling, guidance, tutoring, this is another equity issue, um, especially for kids that have special needs, but we circle back to the need of having a safe space, a private space uh, for, for kids that are experiencing all sorts of dysregulation. The lack of space for collaborative work. And so when you think about that, that really undermines the goal of PBL, right? We're trying to attach ourselves to this specific uh, philosophy of teaching, but if we don't have collaborative work space, then we limit ourselves in that. Another issue specific to Mills Lawn was the overlapping of gym, cafeteria, and performance stage, and performance stage, and how it was actually costing a lot to the district, because when there is a performance, Let's say that the high schoolers are putting together a musical called Shrek that's going to be showing this weekend. <laughs> and they can't use this space because it's already used as a cafeteria and as a gym. So they have, we need to allocate money from the budget for them to rent elsewhere. And that creates uh, a strain financially, but also uh, it's an equity issue for kids that have to arrange transportation. Uh, then there was also, in terms of floor plan issues, there were the issue of the instructional spaces with no daylight and no ventilation at the high school. So we're talking about room 116, we're talking about many of the administrative offices. The nurse office doesn't have ability to ventilate. So think about that in the context of COVID and how if we need to place someone in temporary isolation until they can get home. They get to a space where there is no ventilation. Uh, there were discussions also about how the lab spaces were so small. So, and specific, if I have to be, if I have to give an example, is uh, the proximity between the student stuff and the benzen burners were creating incidents for fires here. So they're just too crammed in that space. Yeah. Uh, I also, it was pointed out that there was no water access in the cafeteria and there was no automated dishwasher there. So I put that on the floor plan because it seemed like we had the right amount of space but not the access to the right equipment in there. Wait, and, where is this at? Uh, in the high school, thank you. In the high school, there's no water access in the cafeteria, so people wanting to refill their bottle, having access to a fountain, and also no access to an automated dishwasher. And what that means is that they have to use disposable utensils and styrofoam and this was one of the complaints in the survey is how we're not in a place where we can have, we can be more environmentally conscious regarding our launches here. 
And then there were so many comments about the trailers and the shoebox. Um, so if we set aside their dire conditions, how they cause issue for the rest of the buildings. So the disruptive noise from the trailer here, how it blocks daylight, and then uh, also think about the shoebox in terms of floor plan. The doors are too narrow for people with mobility issue to be crossing one another, to be moving inside a room. Um, so this is the room in which we put our most vulnerable kids with the highest needs, and uh, it really limits how we can move within it. And that is not talking about the conditions of those, of those two trailers. So the last point that I wanted to talk about here before, I, before you can ask questions and we can look at specifics was the tie, the direct connection that I've seen between the conditions of the survey and the low morale among staff. And I want to preface the rest of what I'm going to say by this is not a guilt trip, this is more of a discussion of how it is important to find and to identify the issues here so that we can find a solution that works really for our staff. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention before I get into it is that uh, the National Education Association predicts that 55% of teachers and educators are going to quit earlier than planned. So we're in a time where we have a big wave of educators leaving the industry and, uh, and in the comments that I've seen in the survey, I saw a lot of signs of low morale. Okay, so it became uh, obvious to me that the facilities, the conditions of the facilities were leading to extra financial burden on the educators. There were stories of teachers buying a TV and a projection device while waiting for a smart screen. So that was coming out of their budget, that they were equipping their, uh, their classroom to provide the 21st century education that uh, they wanted to do. There were stories of, lots of stories of teachers buying portable heating and cooling devices. This comes out of their pocket too. Uh, providing lights, going and scavenging for tables and chairs. So this is also a misuse of their time where they're going around and trying to make up for the conditions of the building. Um, they were also uh, a lot of comments about the state of the staff lounges in both buildings and how it, uh, it undermined the potential for collaboration and for support among staff members. Is there a staff lounge being used in the high school right now? Because the building, the, no, there is now. Is there? there is one technically, but underused, and I think it was used as it was repurposed as the nurse's office for a while. And then there's another room that they say is too cold, too far, and uh, it's so Where far. Is that? Um, so I can speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the the room directly next to the 116 was the original staff lounge in the original building. On the left. Um, yes. Yeah. And then 105 has been our staff lounge since I've been here. In the corner, yeah. Um, and that was the nurses' station in the fourth quarter last year when the students came back. And then um, they moved the nurses' station up to that room off of 116. And then in the process of moving that, we moved one of the photocopiers upstairs to one of the rooms that connects the room. So that was the main reason for a lot of us to go to 105 is doing a lot of prep and then there were tables for lunch and um, I, mean, I know I haven't been <laughs> over that It looks like way. it's being used for storage. Yeah. Yeah. And then if I, it's not, do you want to it, it, well, storage and, and some meeting rooms yeah. in yeah. 105 next year will be used for um, a private space um, for students okay. it, uh, as you referenced. Okay. Just then, highlights the need that there's no, not a staff lounge. Yeah. And then I think that I've, I've read similar concerns here. There are two staff lounges in this building. There's one of them that is incredibly tight. There is only one microwave and I think table for four people. And the bathrooms that run next to it so that people can hear anything that's happening in the bathroom mm -hmm. as they eat. I've heard also of one where they have to choose between having the lights on and the microwave on. So they have to eat in the dark. Yeah. That's the one there. Okay, that's what I gathered. Where is it at? This one too? Uh, the staff lounge. Mm -hmm. Oh, one. right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let me find my... Uh, okay, so most of the 
most of the teachers reported eating in their classroom. And of course, uh, you and I, we've talked about this because if we at some point wanted to consider the use of swing spaces, we wanted to minimize a room being occupied by one person so that we can use that. And obviously the staff launch is not meeting the needs so that we can do that. But on top of that, it also reduces the opportunity for collaboration and support among staff. And this is something that's gonna really undermine us in, in the long term in our, our retention and recruitment efforts. Um, then something else that I mentioned at the very beginning is as much as the, the users really like the green spaces around, they struggled with how open the school grounds were to the rest of the community. Um, so they've had, to, they've had to handle, to manage strangers on the grounds. Uh, so, because of a lack of a fence around the playground, but also they, they had to handle people sleeping or living under the bleachers at the high school. They had to handle dog feces, broken glass, and trash. This was on the staff to do, and this cannot um, uh, come across as uh, a, us valuing their work if they have to put all that work into handling the trash of a community, or the misuse of a community, of the school grounds. Several users reported health issues that they connected to the facilities. One reported that their doctors diagnosed them with school allergies because their symptoms would flare up in August, September as they were coming back after breaks. Uh, and they were not the only one to mention such, uh, having to deal with health issues, uh, respiratory issues mainly. Uh, several users used the word embarrassment when they talked about the high school. Uh, that they felt when there were visits from other schools or when other candidates came to be interviewed, they felt just, uh, they used that word. Um, and then there are lots of lost opportunities for teachers because of the facilities. Uh, one example is that the gym doesn't meet the requirements for OHSAA athletics. And so those are missed opportunities as educators uh, that they feel. So I'm Wait, gonna do you want to explain that? Yeah, so the gym doesn't meet uh, the requirements for being part of the Ohio. It, it, we're part of OHSAA. It is not a tournament sized gym. It's not yeah. it's not a regulation size court. Okay. So we can play our games in it. Yeah. But if we were ever to consider having a tournament, which is way the way schools make money, they host tournaments, we we just would not be able to do that. Okay. It it has to do with the spaces around the gym the basketball. Well it, it has floor, to do with correct? capacity, but also for a high school our our court is not regulation size. We're about, I think it's about four feet shy, which is a considerable amount. So, because I thought um, Jeff had said that the basketball court was regulation, but there wasn't enough space beyond, you know, when you're running to do, to do a, uh, what do you call it? You're talking about the space basket. between the baseline and, and, the, and the wall. wall. Right. And the wall. Yeah, there's not space there, but it, it also is it's, actually it's short. It's actually short. Mm -hmm. So those, those are just my takeaways. I know that I took a fair amount of time. Um, I wanted to see if um, Brian and Kinnett wanted to add anything to that. Yeah, I got some um, items from a few colleagues. But So with the doors opening outward, the other issue with that is that kids get hit in the hallway because you can't see them. So you fling the door open, you can get hit. Um, how, does that, how does that work? given fire safety, is it fire safety you said that it has to go yeah. out that way? So... Only if you exceed 50 people in the room. Say again? I believe only if you exceed 50 people in the room do you they need, just to, need to swing out. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, that's my understanding. Okay. And then you also need two means of egress in a room of that size. But I believe a, a single classroom can't have doors that swing in and meet code. Mm -hmm. They can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that was... The other thing is, I think this kind of ties to the layout issues, um, that if you're moving grade levels, even if it's just one grade level, a lot of times you have to move classrooms. And so that makes it difficult for teachers. Um, it, you know, so in a small school, moving is understood because- You mean moving a teacher from a classroom to another between academic years, from an academic year to another? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, but that was something that came up um, Wait, I didn't understand what you said, sorry. Yeah, so when you have to move 
rooms because you're moving grade the levels. Teachers, yeah. You as a teacher have to, are going to have to. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that makes it difficult, especially if you've established yourself in a room, um, you've created your space, you've got to leave that. So I've heard that from a few people. Um, and that would have happened because, for instance, right now we have a wave of three first grade classes, mm -hmm. and then they're going to become a Isn't this three issue second grades, and then we have to move. Do well, other schools do something different, or in terms of? In many schools, the layout of the building would allow the teacher to stay in that room, but still switch to a different room. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and so then we have reiterating goals um, from time to time getting kicked off the internet here too. Um, and then just reiterating the toilets on in the 1957 <coughs> section um, that's in the fifth grade. Those are actually abutting the fifth grade classrooms. Um, so when someone uses that bathroom, everyone in the room can hear everything happen. So um, that's particularly difficult. Um, they had to close those bathrooms off during testing because it would have been too distracting, but it's still some children still use them. And, and those are children, not the staff. Those, those are children's are bathrooms. Single, yeah, singles. Mm -hmm. singles. They're single stalls because it used to be, I think, a first or kindergarten classroom. So the, there's a door on the other side in those fifth grade classrooms. So they block the door off that goes into the classroom, but that's still there so they can hear through that door. Um, and so that was just, and those don't lock because. But as a parent, I can tell you, like, this is. This leads to constipation in kids, <laughs> completely, but okay, yeah. Yeah, when yeah. if you know people can hear you. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, my child is one, in one of those classrooms and she's like, I don't ever use those bathrooms. <laughs> so, just, that's it. Thank you. Ryan, did you want to add anything? Um, I'll add that in the, uh, and I don't know as much about these two hallways here because I'm mostly either there or out in my modular. Yeah. Um, but in the high school, um, regardless of um, repeated and, and um, repeated, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but repeated roof maintenance, um, the transitions between sections of buildings are always an issue. So where the um, room 115 and 113 meet the wall of the uh, gym, yeah. that cross in the hallway there, almost every time we have a major storm, we need one of those big red trash cans from the cafeteria in there for the, the waterfall that comes through the ceiling. Um, the transition from my building into that glass hallway um, in the last few years has seen more and more leaks and it's discoloring the whatever ceiling uh, texture is there. And then yeah, we've got ceiling tile stuff all over the place. Um, and the um, this is not a uh, staff user issue, but I I got anecdotal evidence from many many students who are avoiding using restrooms for a number of reasons, and the conditions are are top of on those lists. Can I add to Brian's restroom comment? At the high school, um, for students, there are only. <laughs> those restrooms in the hall that lead to the cafeteria and two singles in the shoebox. Mm -hmm. There are restrooms back on the other side of the gym as you go out to the parking lot. Those are the ones we open during games. To have those open regularly during the school day in my mind is a huge safety concern because there is no one it's not really close to any classroom. And so that, in effect, leaves one single set of bathrooms for our students. Um, what is it, four stalls, maybe? And so the huge lines, that's what I kept reading, the huge lines of students. Huge, huge lines, or, you know, I've been a principal, I know what kids do. They say, I'm not going to the bathroom at school. Mm -hmm. That's not. Can you confirm something too? Is that high schoolers are being going to use the bathrooms in the middle school <coughs> part? In the single stalls? Yeah, I think there's some. I think there's some. Um, we 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 have made it, and 
made it an issue to communicate to the students to use the restroom closest to your room, yeah. and that all, doesn't always take. And I'll say, just as a user of those back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I was one of those kids that avoided using the restroom during the day, mainly just the, the multi-age uh, issue of the main hallway bathrooms. Is, as a 7th, 8th grader, I didn't want to be in there at the same time as a 10th, 11th, 12th grader. So. The space up at 204, um, there were restrooms there, and all the plumbing is still under the floor and in the walls. I think it's been used as a small teacher's office at the moment. That, is that the one that's used the, as a teacher restroom? Staff, yeah, they, staff they, restroom? Staff no, restroom. The, so the original, I think the original women's restroom is where Donna Haller's classroom is now, and then the men's restroom is now the staff bathroom. Mm -hmm. And, and they, if there was space to move around, they could be brought back into use. All, all the drains are there. Um, they, were, they were just cut off under the floor. Maybe, but there is a comment in the spreadsheet from the users about that staff bathroom and, and issues with that, and I would suspect that there would be parallel issues with... I don't remember. I'm going to say this. Um, yeah. It's our, yeah. I'll try to track it down. Um, any questions from uh, the people? You yeah. mentioned the, um, the trailers that are out here Yes. in your thing, but my understanding is that trailers are not being used now. No, it's my question. They were not doing it. I was told it was just stored stuff. No, the now. second room is. The first room is mine. Um, oh, okay. That's where I've been since I started Sorry. teaching here. Yeah. And the second room I, is being used. I will also say that the second room um, room is being used oh, by our mental health therapist yeah. for um, for some group therapy. Really? Yeah. Uh, when yeah. I started and working here, it was the, uh, right. and, yeah. gifted and talented in the news uh, production and the news production. And then they moved that into the second office off the gym. So, David, if you look at monitor one here on this map, this is where Brian teaches right now. Yeah. And if you look at the users that gave the answer uh, noise too disruptive, this is 9, 10, 11. Oh, yeah. Because and it became much more of an issue this year, needing to have my doors and windows all open for the airflow exactly. and stuff in the fall. Exactly. Other mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. No, just comments. There's a dividing room, there's a second door. Uh, I wanted. I forgot something. I realized that I did not in my comments talk about the floor plan issues in your classroom in the high school. Is that the way that this building is set up as a 12-sided uh, um, um, form or shape? Uh, you say that students cannot see whatever screen you use from all sides. That you need to bring them in the middle. There's yeah. also questions about accessibility. Students uh, of all mobility cannot that women go down the steps. Uh, there are several, you have a lot of blind spots with the storage units, and so you can't guarantee safety of students. Um, so uh, there are floor plan issues with the use of that specific part. And we have uh, two community groups that share that space that are ranging age from you know 20 to 70. So they're coming in, there's no handrails to get down to the different levels or on the stairs. Um, and then the, uh, when Craig Carter and I were talking about it, they looked and said there's really not enough room in either direction to build the ADA um, level ramp. Your, the ramp would be long enough to hit the, the level on the other side of the room. <laughs> um, for me personally, the, there's also the issue that um, the doors in that room don't allow us to get all of our equipment in and out. So the one time we used, in, when I was in high school, we used the grand piano for a performance. We had to hire a piano moving company to pick it up, and take it out, and retune it in the gym, and then do the reverse an hour later. Um, most schools will have a, a double section door where you can roll everything out into your performance space. Do you like the sound of the room being round as a musician? Um, in, uh, in acoustic terms, it's called a very dry room, meaning it has no echo or very little echo. Yeah. Um, the benefit there, um, I don't know, outweighs the uh, limited flexibility of me being able to reseat students or to, yeah. uh, to move and do different activities. What I was thinking is it's round or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you just blow it out, expand it out. 
and um, make it the way you want it, give you the space for wheelchair access. It's definitely something I've seen in other buildings. They have the built outs. Um, I'm not I'm not in love with the the uh, level floored seating. Um, okay. I've been in many other near near rectangle rooms in Northern Columbus for rehearsals that I'm in, and um, they seem to have a lot more flexibility pedagogically, and there's a, a, enough uh, sound features in there that they eliminate most of the acoustical issues. Okay. I was just thinking because there's there's nothing but grass out there. Blow it out. You know, there's a sidewalk that goes all the way around. If it could be configured to what you want. What about the five in the room? Um, it logistically could seat about 55, and that's elbows to elbows. Um, we've had about 50 in there with the adult band and choir. Um, the storage is pretty limited, um, and the, actually the, level, the distance front to back of those levels is really tight, and you have things knocked over, and it's you know, it kind of safety have little safety hazards you don't think about all over the place. Um, but uh, I mean, it's a double edged sword for me. I grew up in that room and I've taught for more than that amount of time in it. But also, I'd like to be able to do a couple other things um, that I've seen my colleagues do at other locations. Is your office in there? In the yeah, it's one of the two the rooms at the bottom of the stairs. And those rooms are very oddly shaped too. <laughs> They're very what? Oddly shaped. Oddly yeah. shaped. So, so to give people an idea of a the ramp ratio that you would need to put a ramp at the board office, it would have to wrap around basically the entire building. That that's how long the ramp. Oh, would to be. get the right incline. Yes, mm -hmm. to get the incline that that's ADA um, currently. So oh, is that six steps up to the board office. <laughs> I can't remember. It's not, but I, I know, you know, it's, it's not, it's not that high. You don't think of it as that high, but yeah, it would have to go around one side, the back side, and even come along the the third side there. It's so, one foot for every one foot of length for every inch of rise. Right. Mm -hmm. So if there's eight steps or six steps over there. You would need a 48 foot long yeah. ramp. Yeah. And then there is the issue that you have offices in the basement there. Well, we're not talking about the offices there, but even if you were getting the accessibility to the main floor, you mm -hmm. still wouldn't have the accessibility to yeah. the downstairs office spaces. Mm -hmm. Other comments, or should we switch gears here? Dorothy, I think that you did a wonderful job just capturing like the observations mm -hmm. and the concerns and the needs of the teachers and I thank you because that was a really good presentation after sitting down while eating my dinner last night and with my computer. Um, I think that you just captured everything that the teachers wanted you to, so thank you. And I want to acknowledge both. I haven't included every single issue, I've just tried to get around mm -hmm. that. Mike, did you have, oh, I thought you had a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well let's go on to, hang on, let's go back here, um, to the experts' reports. Um, one thing I failed to mention is that um, Michael and Scott, we met with Bill Griffith, as Megan has suggested. I reached out to Eli, but I've not heard back from him yet. Eli Hurwitz, who works with students around um, computer you know, education. Um, so we had a meeting with him, and then this afternoon, uh, Michael and I, David, and Jerry, and, and yeah, Jerry. Jerry uh, when we walked down the hall here, we talked with teachers, and it was interesting. Uh, the information you know we were gathering from Bill, in terms of you know the fact that we have Mavecca right here, we we've got a lot of resource here for for our IT. Uh, but yet, there seems to be issues in the building that uh, you know that we're not that, that the teachers are not seeing kind of the fruits of that. Uh, uh, what we have, we should be able to have with Mavetta right here. So, I, so anyway, why don't we start with you guys? Um, what you learned about the system? So these are, like I say, beginning uh, reports from experts looking at systems. We most this was the only day we've been here in grade school. Um, but so why don't you guys start with your Am I on the right document here? Oh, you're right here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's it. There it is. 
So I don't know which one you want to start. Well, I'll just, we've got basically a short electrical part because I think you're going to cover some of that too. But um, yeah. most of this was at the high school, as students said, we didn't get into here till today. So um, as far as the electrical yeah, capabilities of boxes, and they're current and safe, uh, but they, will, they can be added to, upgraded, you know, for added capacity as whatever the design becomes in the school and the high school. They look like they can be addressed in a, in a minimal fashion. Um, power outlets, everybody wants more power outlets. I heard that today from all the teachers. Again, that's pretty much an easy thing to do from an electrical standpoint. I think the big thing is to understand what teachers at Mills Lawn need versus teachers at the high school. Everybody has a slightly different requirement for their space and what they want to do with their students. So. I think one of the keys is understanding what those needs are. As Brian, your whatever your needs may be, uh, is going to be critical. Whatever happens down the road, um, Scott, you have USB charging stations. We've talked a lot about computers, uh, different ways to charge them and have them ready for the next day. Whether it's through USB ports, additional outlets, I I'm thinking about charging stations type of thing, things like you see in an airport, you know, when you're at a gate and you want to charge up quickly. So I think we need to understand what the needs are at this school and the high school to address that. But I don't see that as a major issue. But all in all, we can bring more power into both schools. The panels are okay, they can be upgraded. I haven't seen any dangers. Uh, one of them has some old switches I think we talked about yeah, earlier. Pushmatics. Pushmatics. That all can be changed out. So from a, just a, a over the top electrical look, I think we're, I think we're fine. So that was just at the high school, right? I couldn't quite tell from the mm -hmm. documents. We went uh, well today. I looked at the panels here. Okay. Uh, but this this is addressing primarily the high school. But the panels here are in great shape also. So if we need more power, which we're probably going to need more power because everybody wants screens or this or that or whatever it may be, we can bring it in. Okay. It's kind of the message. I have a question. Yep. So, are you saying that, that if there is, let's say, the gymnasium's air conditioned, or there's some addition that goes on to the building, you're not saying that we may not we may not need a full electrical service upgrade, or, or are you? Are you saying there's? I'm saying there's we don't need. We won't need a full. We can we can add to what we have. There's and current we capacity get, we that get, to support. I think there's enough AC capacity to and bring everything in. If we need to add another box, we'll add another box. But I don't think we need a major overhaul of the system, is what I'm saying. That would be uh, one of the things I would want a professional intellectual engineer on that absolutely. And team to verify. Absolutely. My ears perked up when I heard yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, it depends what we do. Yeah, so absolutely. It, right. all, it all hinges on that. So. And it could always be brought in as a separate feed, leaving what we've got doing what it's doing. Scott, did you want to add in regards to what we learned about uh, in terms of your uh, when we talked to Bill Griffith um, regarding you know just the IT uh, possible you know what Mavetta brings to the schools and well I, I I'm not certain to what extent everyone is aware of the resource that Mavetta is yeah, that's to us I mean. it's a tremendous asset. Um, school children in about roughly 65,000 school children in about eight counties all get their internet right through Yellow Springs, Ohio. It comes right into this village and then it gets dispersed through Maveca out to a bunch of different places, which means they have a lot of infrastructure, they have a lot of bandwidth, they have people that know how to deal with that stuff. Uh, and we are the beneficiaries of all that. Um, the fact that we are able to have direct fiber connections from both of these facilities to Maveca is something that most school districts would just kill to have. <laughs> um, I, I can't overstate the importance of that, that fact. Um, now that has only a tiny about tiny bit to do with our, our task here, but it's still an important, important thing to, to keep in mind. Um, and I just, I'm 
grateful that we've got that resource and I hope the school district will continue to leverage the heck out of it for as long as it's there because uh, it's a tremendous resource. Uh, that's really all I have to say. Well, we talked about, um, you know, the, the whiteboards yeah. and what? we talked about copy, the, you know, the need for uh, effective yeah. copying and so on. So, so there's, you know, as you said, so there's, there's a lot of capacities. There's plenty of fiber here for growth now and in the future because Rebecca is, is here. Um, we've got, I think we came up with 72 uh, wireless connection points. Uh, in both schools. Um, it was nice to talk to the teachers today because we found there's some spots where there's some issues in connecting. Whereas when we talk to Bill, Bill says that should be enough. So those kind of details, it's going to be great to talk to each teacher in whatever their room is and find out what's happening, what isn't happening. So, uh, But as far as the, the equipment you're using, the routers and everything, it's all great. It's all state of the art. Uh, Cisco is pretty much the king of that business. Um, one thing to think about, we, we heard some comments about the printing stations in here and at the high school. So maybe whatever happens here and at the high school, we need to look at reconfiguring those rooms to make them work for you. There are some issues. We heard a few issues going around, but what are the particulars? Was, you know, getting together with the, what stations the teachers use. I heard when you print some things, sometimes you can't stop it, it continues to print. So there's some software and some connection issues that need to be resolved. And maybe those rooms need to be settled somewhere else in whatever the configuration needs to be. Same thing at the high school. I, would, uh, yeah, I wanted to jump on that, if you don't mind, Michael. Uh, I remember one comment explained that a copier was in the central room of the tower and would not work because it was so humid in there that the paper would stick. So we're talking about uh, technology in, in here, but it ties back to HVAC and humidity control, that issues that we have in buildings and how the HVAC uh, creates issues in other things. Yeah, and I would add to that, that there really are, in my mind, there are really a couple of areas where the intersection between the technology infrastructure and the larger building issues are pretty important, and those are uh, first and foremost, the locations for the what we call MDFs and IDFs, the wiring closets, the, the places where you put servers and switches and all that stuff. Uh, I have yet to be in a school that is as old as any either of these buildings where there was a sufficient location for that stuff because when those buildings were built, that need wasn't there. And so there was no place built to say, well, let's make a room that's secure, that we can lock, that, that's got adequate ventilation and is equipped to run a bunch of really hot running electrical equipment. No, that, that never happens. So every wiring closet I've ever been in, unless it was newly built, is, is utterly inadequate. And that's something that ought to be paid attention to, in my opinion, however you do it. Um, uh, because the as you basically can. those end up in like old broom closets, it's whatever right. whatever is available, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever is available. Is what and you know. I mean, like you know, like for sorry. HVAC systems, like when when they build new schools, the HVAC system for those rooms is specially designed because they're kept at a lower temperature than what you would try to keep students at, and mm -hmm. it, yeah, the the airflow, and, and it's also built almost like separate and with a backup cooling system because. Right. If that room gets too hot, I mean, it's not, you know, a classroom, you can open some windows, you can do some things to mitigate, but the server, if the server goes down, then, then pretty much all learning stops for the day. Yeah, yeah um, there's, there's <laughs> servers now, I mean, there's no temperature issue, but there's sharing rooms, you guys, there's paper stored in there and other supplies, so Bill would like to have his own room where he can go in there and do a diagnosis and whatever, and, and it's secure. He doesn't have to worry about somebody coming in there grabbing a piece of paper and hitting something on the keyboard or pulling a connector out. So security yeah. is a big feature for those rooms. I don't think there's an issue because you don't have a whole room full of servers where you need a super controlled environment. If you have a few pieces in there and it's not super sensitive to if it's a hot day or anything like that, but it's a security issue. It's a security issue, it's an electrical supply issue, it's a, uh, it's a ventilation issue as well, but 
maybe to a lesser extent. The other thing, I, and this is really what you were saying earlier, is um, the whole problem of how you get printed output from student work and teacher work and so forth is a, is a thorny one, and all kinds of things have been tried over the years. Uh, I believe it's fair to say that most school environments are moving toward centralized print stations instead of trying to have a printer in every classroom. You move towards centralized print stations where you can utilize larger devices that can copy and print things faster and more economically and then you find ways to you know handle all the ergonomics and the you know the, you have a student that's dedicated to go and get stuff off the printer when it happens if, if it's in you know, an elementary building or whatever it, those spaces were never built into old buildings either and so there really aren't good places to to locate those kinds of things if you're doing any kind of room uh, uh, building reconfiguration or new construction, that those ought to be planned into it rather than, uh, oh gosh, we didn't think about where to put the printer. Um, I think sometimes the, uh, the need for the stable infrastructure that you don't see is understated. We had a day in December last year when we were teaching online where Mebeka went down for you know, two and a half hours and we didn't do it anymore. You know, we were, we were standing around talking to each other for a little while until it all came back up and I was communicating with people at other schools that were Mebeka schools and I said, are you guys down too? Yeah, we're down too. Somebody uh, augured the wrong spot. Because um, I, I was at the office that day in another school district when, when that happened. And, uh, Someone did what? Auger. They they broke a they major broke cable, cable under the ground. Somebody oh. somebody didn't call uh, call before you did, <laughs> and and it caused basically like a countywide outage for every single school district that relies on Mebeka's internet. Um, okay. They stopped after they they hit it, but it was it was a big it was a big whoops. Um, they were putting they were putting up something really large. I can't remember what it was. And, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I remember that was a day that work work stopped for everybody, and it it took more than I thought it was more than two and a half hours. I thought it was, it was down for quite some time. It was a good amount of time. Yeah, yeah it was it was pretty much a day. But wouldn't that time. pale in comparison to let's say your switches going out in the middle of testing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if your Cisco infrastructure went down in the middle of testing, that would be the worst nightmare right then. So can I ask a question about this? Is that um, I'm so glad that we have Mebeck in town because there are resources, and and I see how lucky we are that they're in town. But we still are dealing with some connectivity uh, issues in the buildings, and I still um, so I'm saying I'm hearing that opportunity, and I'm hearing from the user's point of view how it is sometimes unreliable. So, so where so, do you think so there you are going to have issues? connectivity issues. You've got a system in the school yeah. and when we walked around today and had a conversation, you've got some dead spots. So that's all fixable. Okay. We, we can figure out why that's happening. Whatever the reason is, we need a, we need a boost signal in the kindergarten room. Okay. But when we went to the middle of the building, we talked to Mikasa and two other teachers and they're fine, they're in the middle of the building. So they, they That's are, all. So we need to map out. So we, maybe one step here is mapping out those dead spots. And find out what, where yeah, those right, spots sure. are. And that is, that it's all fixable. The system was designed on paper to say, oh, we're going to put one wireless access point for each classroom. Yeah. And on paper that might work fine, but where the rubber meets the road is, yeah. if the teacher's in a classroom and they, they don't have a signal, they don't have a signal. And okay. so then it, you know, doesn't matter what's on paper, that has yeah, to be fixed. Exactly. So, the, and sorry, Judith. The key with, with this infrastructure for your IT is whatever we do with the buildings, whether we upgrade them or whatever, ceilings yeah. come down, then we have an opportunity to run cables and reroute things and do everything you need, make sure you get a signal over here and over here and over here. When there's nothing up there but a, a, a way to run cables, it's real easy. Outlets. Cat six connectors we need to upgrade uh, from old okay. Cat five connectors. I'm sure you have some that we don't know about, but we can do all that stuff during that process. But as far as the dead spots with the wire, was that we could fix that. I don't see okay. that as being an issue. So I think this is where it would be useful in the spreadsheet to highlight which 
classrooms are reporting was issues so that we can map those out. Sure. sure. Yeah. And you've got a lot of that information to this question. Yeah, I'm sure that we should do another pass with the staff to make sure we're not forgetting some, but uh, they were a fair amount mm -hmm. of them being reported. The other thing we saw is you've got screens and projectors and different things in, in rooms and you know those projectors that Terry said we were talking about that they're outdated so whatever we do you yeah. know we upgrade to whatever the next latest thing if we do this uh, if we go with you know whatever each classroom may need we need to find out specifically what they need at Ms. Juan what they need at the high school and it can be addressed I kind of recommend to having a hardwired connection almost in every room if we, oh, we break it all apart absolutely. and not rely on wireless totally. If you yes, got a teacher yes, yes. trying to make a PowerPoint presentation and yeah. you want to have a hardwired connection, you just don't want that to go down. Uh, so there's issues with Chromebooks and Bluetooth connections and signals get dropped. It just stuff happens. So, but that at the time we renovate or whatever happens with the buildings. We can run all those cables. We can reroute everything. We can move it to where it needs to be and take care of those issues that are happening now. So I do. I do have a few more questions. If that's okay with you, um, I saw the comment about the telephone and internal communication and how it was operational. Uh, I wanted to add to this that um, in the high school there were so many comments about people wanting to reach out to Judy. What is her role? She's the Judy Cosler. No. Special ed supervisor. Oh, no. Special ed supervisor, and they could not reach her because she doesn't have a phone in her office. And so, uh, as we think about that, we should also make sure that we are highlighting the stakeholders that should have a phone uh, and that should be uh, looked into that uh, into that phone system here because they are not hitting the right people. Yeah, that's a provisioning issue more than that. Yeah. Yes, it's not a technological, but as we think, we might talk about extending it. Um, and you can do that with the system you have, the voice system over the yeah. Cisco switch. The, the phone system phones, we have you can do it. is not a um, Cisco system. It's a Cisco imitation system. Oh, okay. So it, there, there are there are some problems with it. Okay. Okay. I think that I think there was a that was a price point decision made in the past. Um, so, but you know, it's so you need certainly it. more of an easier fix than. A, and then, okay. and then the part about security is that we need more because it's um, the lack of key pass means that some... Well, the security thing, when we were talking about it, um, cameras, more cameras, what, what yes. you have now, I don't know exactly what they have at the high school we've talked about. Yeah. Um, intrusion, door locks, all that thing, that may be something that you can contract to Mavecca where they can control that versus you controlling it in the school. They were right across the road from you. They're experts at that stuff. Okay. So they can control fire alarms, all that stuff, and make sure the software is up to date and if something happens, whatever it may be, they got their hands around it. I, I, think, I think that we need, from what I understand, we need people in the office to also look at who is presenting and coming in there. There is that level Absolutely. of being yeah. looked in that it needs to be people that know, that can recognize Faces. And we did. We we have increased our cameras, etc. Yeah. yeah. But unless I'm remembering cor incorrectly, there were we, there were issues about we couldn't place them everywhere. Same with uh, readers on the doors because we got those when I came, and, and it just we weren't able to put as many in as we could, and that was okay. a function of kind of some of the limitations of of the buildings. Okay. Right. And then that also can become a function of whichever system you purchase. Uh, you know, we'll handle X number of cameras and X number right. of channels, and then there's a the disk space problem. That might be the part of the equation that you could outsource to Mabeka and say, yeah, why don't you, you host it on a server, you store all the stuff. We're still going to have somebody here looking at the camera monitors, deciding who gets in the door, you know. And that kind of thing. Well, so they can it take be a server you don't have data. Buy. You know, if you and say what happened on Tuesday, blah blah blah, and they can go pull that for you. And you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. This guy was coming in the back door to get a picture of him. So. Okay, yeah. I'm going to move forward because we've got a fair amount to cover yet. Okay. Um, can I just have? And that was a great. Can yeah. I just make one comment? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you for. Uh, uh, 
really good report. I would say this focuses on the backbone stuff, and you mentioned a scope that was missing, but I want to emphasize it, which was the, the user interface with the technology. Right. So, for example, if you would have got if you would have gotten a new building, your your typical classroom would have had a an ultra short throw projector, what they call an interactive whiteboard, where the technology is in the pen. Mm -hmm. There would have been an audio system to be able to play back music or, or whatever the video is. Uh, there would have been a voice amplification system. I don't know if you use those much, but it's a little lapel mm -hmm. mic. Mm -hmm. And then the, the sound is, is distributed around the room. Um, there would have been a, a, a teacher's technology outlet, some type of um, system to um, show video. There could be a centralized video system where they could show video to all the first grade classrooms or things like that. Um, so I just I think that's important. Like if, if the vision is, hey, we're going to renovate a building, and you're probably not going to bring old tech back in. What does that new tech look like? Mm -hmm. uh, elementary teachers love the Elmos, the um, document mm -hmm. cameras. So mm -hmm. that's all uh, a pretty big price component of the whole tech package. So it's just something to consider. It's huge. It's also, in my experience, not a one size fits all. Uh, even within an elementary school, uh, different teachers at different grade levels are going to use this technology in very different ways. And at the high school, it tends to run more across subject areas. And an English teacher will use stuff very differently than a science teacher will, and probably needs different stuff. Um, and that's, you know, the, you have to, you have to, I do think you have to watch the one-size-fits-all approach. We're just going to give everybody same the, same, thing. the same thing. Um, so do that's you where you've got to visualize it to the teacher. I'm sorry. Do you individualize it? To well, you, it's you pretty hard to do that, but I I do think it's appropriate to to talk to your science teachers and say, okay, what's the most important technology for teaching uh -huh. science? Uh, what's the most important technology for teaching music education? What's you know because they all have. So you, and then at the different grade levels, you're yeah, talking. yeah, the different yeah, grade levels. Yeah, I don't know. What what do you want? What what do you like? Yeah. And listening location. to what he just said with that, you know, with that package, I would say that in Mills Lawn and other, you know, buildings that I have been in, um, K5, K6, K8, all the teachers would use everything that he said. They would just use it differently. Okay. But they would need everything that he just mentioned. That feels like the minimum standard, and then yes. what do we need on top, on of, top that? of it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Specialized needs. The, the Elmo, if you if you don't understand what that is, is it? killer piece of educational technology. It's just, I don't know any teacher that's used one that would give it up. Well, now really I have to look it up. <laughs> well, it's, it's basically the device that replaced the overhead opaque projector. Yeah, right. projector. You, you, you put something down here, it might be a piece of paper, it might be a book, it might be a picture of drawing, oh, or it could be a live bug that's crawling around and it gets made large and put up there for everybody to see. Okay, why don't we go to um, Jerry? Do you want to talk about what, yeah. what you figured out so far? Or uh, you can read most of my report. I go over some high points. I did add uh, something this afternoon which uh, Dorte touched on, which I think is important. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. As far as the uh, HVAC system at the high school, um, it's uh, accomplished by numerous uh, rooftop mount, roof mounted uh, condensing units, and the age of those units uh, ranges from 10 to 20 years. The school has three gas fired boilers and a hot water boiler. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, gas-fired hot water boilers along with gas-fired electric uh, resistance heaters that are in the air handlers. Um, it's, it's, found, it's felt that the current HVAC system the equipment is might likely adequate to handle the, the uh, current class, classroom heating and cooling loads and note that the gym and the hallways aren't uh, air conditioned. But the uh, HVAC system, control system is, is very problematic and uh, replacement of that control system is likely advisable. Uh, that was installed 11 years ago. 
Uh, the contractor that installed it, uh, in my opinion, didn't do a good job and didn't follow through on making it work. Uh, so, uh, but the equipment is like, for the existing facilities, equipment probably had, likely has the capacity to heat and cool the building, but it seems like the control system is a disaster. Uh, what I did want to touch upon is the indoor, indoor air quality. It's questionable whether the current, um, what's known as, as ASHRAE, which is the American Society of uh, Refrigeration, Heating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, building ventilation standards are being met. And this needs to be explored, especially in light of the current pandemic. And that issue, along with air filtration systems, materials, and replacement schedules, needs to be addressed by the uh, uh, maintenance plan advisor and their evaluation of the, of the HVAC systems. Uh, the plumbing uh, at the uh, high school, uh, some of it is original. There was a, a, a large galvanized service line that failed about 10 years ago and um, the, that was the main service line and it experienced uh, a leak uh, in an underground accessible area and they fitted that with a copper liner pipe which uh, reportedly still provides adequate flow and remains trouble free. There is another underground, underground galvanized line which is uh, susceptible to corrosion which uh, runs uh, over to the locker room area but when they did the 2002 edition, uh, the maintenance folks uh, had valves installed, so if that line fails, uh, it can be replaced overhead uh, without uh, addressing the underground line. Uh, the restroom, the two, the two restrooms, uh, student restrooms, uh, have been upgraded. Uh, they're tiled, they're well maintained, they have modern fixtures, uh, but... Which uh, ones are you talking about here? In the high school. No, no, I know, but the... the two rest student restaurant restrooms the at the end of the hallway. Yeah. By the end of... By On the, the first floor. Yeah, by the cafeteria. Right. Yeah. Uh, those are felt to be adequate, but obviously uh, there's a problem in the three-story structure with inadequate restrooms, and that definitely needs... Uh, to be addressed, and possibly maybe additional restrooms uh, in other portions of the school. Um, what are the other high points here? Gary, there was the comment on the, uh, the uh, air conditioning and the controls for that. Remember on the uh, uh, the well, the whole control system needs. Yes. Yeah. The whole control yeah. system needs to be upgraded. Well, yeah, but we're talking more about the boilers then. But it's like for the air conditioning and all of that as well. All the controls for the heating, for the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system likely needs to be replaced. Controls are the brain of the the HVAC, and they had the the system was originally installed with what are called pneumatic controls. And uh, they're still in operation out there, but they interface with a programmable controller that was installed when they air conditioned the three-story tower. And uh, it's a disaster. It never <laughs> that, worked properly. Well, it never worked HVAC. properly. Yeah. But then from the, the get-go. Then the mini slits, you say which, are, which are not on that system, their controls don't work either. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But they're, so they're, they're, all the controls in the this system all, need, to be, yeah. need to be looked at. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else? As far as some other comments out there, I would like to mention that as far as the modular units go, uh, there, there was a comment made about there's moisture and mildew problems in those, in those modular classrooms. An inspection of the building from the outside uh, we noticed that 
the foundation, uh, the size of the foundation exceeds the, the size of the um, of the building itself, and it's open concrete block. Water runs down the face of the of the uh, of the brickwork and runs into the concrete block foundation, and then can get underneath the modular units. In addition to that, there was never any vapor barrier barrier put down below the floor in those modular units. So if uh, either long term or short term, if they would install a, a concrete mortar cove at the base of that wall to cover up the openings in the foundation block and put some plastic sheeting for a vapor barrier underneath the underneath those modular units, that would significantly improve that issue. I know Jack told me that the, had to run air conditioning in the summer because of moisture and mildew problems in there. Well, uh, that's that's one thing to do to, mit to mitigate that. Um, uh, <clears throat> Dave will probably uh, discuss this, but most of the original windows in the high school have been replaced with thermal pane windows, and uh, they were originally. Uh, designed to open, but there were security issues, and so the uh, maintenance folks uh, disabled that. So those windows can't be open; they're permanently shut because students would open them during the day and then come back at night and get in the building. So the the windows in that building, for the most part, are in pretty good shape. Uh, it, as it's been said by some other people and before, I was out there on a structural inspection a few years back. Uh, that building uh, is, is designed uh, such that the, most of the interior walls can be demolished. And so that building uh, can be reconfigured. Uh, the, the walls that are there can can disappear. So you got <laughs> kind of got a blank sheet of paper as far as reconfiguring that. Is that in the tower? In the tower. In the tower. Okay. And uh, I think uh, you also noted that you could even take out the wall that's underneath the uh, overhang uh, and expand it out toward the driveway there by the cafeteria. So uh, there's some there's some flexibility there. Uh, there is an unused elevator shaft in that in that uh, portion of the building, the three-story building too, that can also be used as a vertical pipe chase for, for vertical chase for ducts, wiring, uh, plumbing, whatever. So um, that's kind of a, an asset to their, to the building. Uh, there, there are aspects of the Ohio building, uh, of the building that don't meet the current Ohio building code or OSHA or ADA um, requirements for new construction. Uh, some of those may be grandfathered in and some may require upgrade uh, by building officials if, if it's not addressed by choice. So uh, those things need to be looked at. And then uh, my last comment regarding high school is there, there appears to be a lack of storage space at the facility as evidenced by uh, materials and equipment being stored in areas intended for other use. Uh, when I looked at the locker rooms and the showers were full of bicycles. <laughs> the showers also don't function. No. I mean, that's, that's why they use this. Storage. Well, I, I was told by folks who uh, attended school out there that the students never used the showers in, in the last two decades, even when they were operational. But uh, if they were to be used, the showers would have to be. Mm -hmm would have to be renovated. Uh, we did take a look at, a uh, brief look at Mills Lawn today, some of the high, uh, high points there, is that the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, restrooms, windows, in the 1952 part of the building, um, all need significant improvements. Uh, there's some deteriorated concrete uh, out here, uh, near the door accessing the playgrounds here on the north side of the building. 
that that needs to be replaced. Um, and uh, when we do that, uh, it needs to be ADA accessible as well. Uh, there's a site drainage issue uh, over here at the uh, uh, southeast corner of the choir room that needs to be addressed. And uh, then the uh, universal problem of uh, sound disturbance associated with the band room <laughs> uh, located behind the school. So uh, that's the brief takeaway from uh, the Mills Lawn uh, uh, tour this afternoon. Can I clarify one thing? Sure. Um, when you said that the gym and the hallways are the only spaces that aren't air conditioned, technically the music room at the high school is only run on window units and one mobile unit that were added afterwards, so I'm also not on the okay. AC side of that system. Um, and then the modular out here, for my room, the AC unit is to the point where MSD cannot find the leak in the mini or whatever the, the system that they have. So Craig installed a window unit um, with window vents, and it it barely keeps up in August and in April or uh, May. Well, something need, definitely needs to be done yeah. about that. Uh, yeah. Band space out there. Also, I oh, oh just. Um, I heard HVAC for the 1952 section, but the 1957 section. That's, that's all the further we got. Was, was oh, okay. We haven't seen it. We haven't gotten any further. So we got further. Yeah. Can I, I, yeah. I want to add uh, what you said about the, the bathrooms in the high school is that I'm glad to hear about they are in functioning order, but uh, we still have the capacity issue, you know, the number of stalls. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that there were more bathrooms in the high school, and they were in the oh, yeah. tower and right. they were removed right. uh, for I'm not sure what for classroom or an office or no they were like being that. vandalized by the students and that was the response that was the response you, you students way back then no. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but anyway um, I also wanted to say in terms of the locker rooms then the showers not working that's been true for from what I can understand over 25 years that they have not been that they were the school decided to not have them function. I mean, that you know, it's it's not an issue of deterioration of the locker rooms. It's an issue of um, there was a decision made basically to not have those uh, showers working because they have not been working for 25 years at least. I think there's also the. I mean, there's a big difference in how locker rooms were built in those buildings compared to how they are now. Okay. With student comfort, comfort and and. You know, taking a shower out in front of all of your peers was something 20 years ago was completely acceptable. Today, it's just not. So, like the standards of, I think, locker rooms have changed significantly. And then, even when I think about plumbing in the high school, um, the main bathrooms are the ones that work. The ones in the, the um, McKinney side, the more those toilets get flushed, the more odor we get in the classrooms. So, like, there's some other issue around some something in the plumbing there. And then the staff restrooms in the back of the office, those are continually a problem, a drainage problem, as far as having to have them snaked out regularly. Um, and I don't know, I don't know what the structural integrity of those lines are running under the building. Um, but the, and then the new bathrooms in the new part, those are fine. But the, the middle school and the staff ones are the most problematic ones. It's pretty clear that there's a need for a lot more bathrooms. The staff ones, uh, it's quite like that band right in here. Over your band there, there's the sand. There's the sand. All the heat and air is up on the roof, and there are air intakes, there's fresh air intakes on those, and your vent pipes are probably coming out fairly close to them. And because they're all lined up along there. Okay. Yeah. Do you okay. think that would be the same thing in 1952 in the link? Because we have. But the toilet smell down there yeah. are, is from the urinals, and they need the um, those those pots, those oil pots need to be changed out. They get changed twice a year. Maybe we should up them to three times a year. Because of the usage. Yeah. Yeah. And then my question was either for you, maybe Mike, about the noise and how loud HVAC gets to the point that they can't hear emergency announcements. So what can be done for... That for needs to be replaced. Yeah. What we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need to use window mm -hmm. units. Mm -hmm. No, but they also talked about the heaters. Yeah, the one that comes off the 
office at the high school into the nurses station and into Lori's room is pretty loud. Um, but but also the, the heaters, the, the, blow, the blowers, the heat blowers, I think that's how they named it, and that, that were so loud and also full of mildew and mold. But you're and talking the ones here? Yeah. Okay, those are um, old blowers and no one has really been servicing them. There's supposed to be air dampers outside, so that they bring in fresh air, it gets heated going over a coil, so you're not losing heat, it's okay. part of your heater. They're all, I just looked down into them, they're all full of dust, dirt, everything the kids have dropped into them. So they really need to be taken apart and cleaned out or completely replaced. Okay. And the, re and the, um, the blower motors on them, some of them are very old. The newer ones, and in fact a few of the old ones, a few of them are nearly silent. You, you can't hear them, and a, a few others. You know, there's probably bears so going if they are well. serviced and replaced, if we think that this is the system that we want to keep for heating and blowing, yeah. they could bring fresh air and they, they could they're be supposed quiet. to be bringing fresh. There's supposed to be an automated damper in there, and no one even knows if they're working or not. Okay. But they're those are original, aren't they? Those oh, are original, so and so my question would be: Are they still serviceable? We well, talk about kids a lot of reasons things it's in there and, and all that. There's a lot of reasons. To be, think they before use. this One's process solution. started, I had an informal conversation with Craig Conrad who said that the the older units in Mills Lawn it, it's getting extremely difficult it was in his time to get parts for them so he recommended replacing those okay. not that they're conceptually were wrong it's just that they couldn't if you needed a new blower motor the chances are you couldn't get one okay so I guess my next question is for you is what what can be considered in terms of replacement I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, okay, but, but that uh, that condition would be a one-for-one -one replacement with a unit vent with a new unit vent okay. that maybe can both heat and cool. Okay. But I think we're getting into okay. solutions, okay. Right. and that may okay. be one of no, you're right. several okay. solutions back. down the road. I, I did want to add on the, well, no, but I'm going to let you go, Dave. Okay, so I was asked to look at the, this is up at the high school, the exterior and the roof. So I've only been on one small part of roof. I, I've not had an opportunity to walk on any of the other roofs. So I was on the high rise roof and on the outside, I've only gone around the outside. I've not addressed anything on the outside from the inside. So in other words, no windows were open, no doors were open looking at the inside of them. So strictly on an outside basis. So um, the, my overall impression, um, well actually I, I suppose I should begin with Despite the negative impressions that many villagers have of the high school buildings, they appear on first observations to be in relatively good condition. Um, particularly uh, because there's been very little maintenance done to them and one would expect that they'd be in much worse condition at this stage. Um, the structures all appear to have good framework. The components have all endured despite the lack of updating. Um, Many of the, com all, pretty much all the components on the exterior of the building would be very similar to what you'd get if it was a new building. It would be pretty much a like for like type replacement. Um, there were basic safety issues that probably do need to be addressed there, like the, the stairwell on the side, um, the antenna, which we're probably not going to do much about, but some other things like that. But the, the high rise building you mentioned already that it could be expended out the side. Um, the one issue on that is still that wall. No one knows if that wall has been re-anchored to the frame or anchored to the framework. The one on the elevator shaft end that gets the slight movement in it, that was supposed to be bolted onto the frame of the building. And when I was there, um, I didn't have time to go up into one of the classrooms and pop a ceiling tile. Um, doors and windows, they're all they're all in, uh, I mean, as far as the outside goes and being sealed, they're all pretty good. I did have another sheet here where I actually did it window by window, and there are some broken, there's some broken glass in a few of them. Screens. I was, was going to say, in the back, there are some single panes. Yeah, panes yeah, but I did, I did that in this one, okay. not, not in this one. Okay. So, yeah, and then I was just asked to make it small. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's just basic um, expansion joints that need new caulking in them, which is a normal maintenance item. Uh, visually, I'd have to say that when you drive up to the school, the exterior is unappealing would be probably the politest, kindest word I could use for it. I mean, 
to think you actually have to go to school there or work there for a day, I think, starts as misery looking at the colors on the outside. I mean, a lot of it can stay there. So, oh, the brick is great, but those splashes of color are completely sucking it down. And for, I think, relatively small money, they could all be replaced. The ones that need to be, you know, that could be replaced, repainted, resurfaced, whatever. Um, so windows were okay. The shoe boxes, you know, they're always considered the stepchildren of the school buildings, and people consider them basically to be sort of trailers, but actually they're, they're modular buildings. And the whole concept of them going in there, they're actually a decent building. They're on a foundation, they've got a complete brick outside on it, they've got a roof over them. So, yes, they were a fast build. Um, and you mentioned the crawl space there, but people also talk about the floors being slightly bouncy in there. We're probably using them for slightly more than they were originally intended when they were in the factory. But with the big crawl space we have, it would be fairly easy to go down, put in concrete pads underneath, put some jacks and some reinforcing beams under those. That would be very, very little money. And actually, and then those spaces, I have no idea why people do not have good air in there because they're the one area in the school that has, every room has its own heating unit, its own heating and cooling unit, and each of those should be supplying fresh air every moment that it's on. So if, if there is problems there on air, again, it comes back to what you were saying. It's a control issue. I think we've got control issues on every bit of heating and cooling in the school. Um, the music room. I think it's a very iconic building. It may not be great for the for, for music, but I think it's a very iconic piece of school that can be made to look very cool and probably repur repurposed into something like a, a really good meeting room or a lecture hall or something like that. I mean, you've already got it. And I think at this stage, we shouldn't be thinking of getting rid of anything because there's no budget to build anything. So you should be keeping your money, instead of demolishing, build what you need beside it and repurpose what we have. Um, the gymnasium and surrounding buildings, they're all in, in really, really good shape as far as the outside goes. I mean, they're all brick. There's nothing to deteriorate. All the windows are all well caulked and sealed. Um, the one thing that's not nice is there's scuppers coming off the design so the, so the roof water runs down the side of all those buildings might be an idea at some stage to actually just put like a box cutter coming down from them and move the water away slightly so we don't end up with a foundation issue or something at a later stage. The roofing, it's all bit, bitumen built up ballasted roofing, um, all professionally in, installed. We, we definitely have leaks here and there. Um, most of the leaks are small. I'm going to ask you questions later about where your ones are because I have not been up on those. Um, some of, the, some of the roofs have been uh, restored, so the ballasted roofs, you know, they're out there, they get sun on them all the time. So all these roofs, they all basically have a heavy tar, um, some of them are probably blowtorched together or welded together, and then they're covered with stone. But it's still, the direct sunlight is on them all day, every day, so they, they take a beating. After about 15, 18 years, they start to dry out, you start to get cracks, some of the seams start to open, and um, they can come back and reuse the same roofing and basically restore it back to a semblance of what it was at the beginning. So some of those have just been done, some more are coming up for that, but all in all, the, the roofs, other than the gymnasium, should all be workable and repairable in the near future. The gymnasium roof, that really needs to go onto a budget for, for a placement. That, that roof, first of all, there's no insulation in the roof at all. Um, it's pretty well worn out, and if it leaks, it's going to destroy one very expensive wood floor in, in that room. So um, that, would, that would be the number one roof to, to look at replacing in, in, a, in a budget cycle. And um, yeah, so the, the shoebox roof was redone six, seven years ago. That's still uh, under warranty. Yeah. Um, so I know that people had um, a lot of concern about the sparking receptacle in the tower last year, and they, they, you know, people feel that that's like bad wiring in the building. But 
when that, when that receptacle sparked and shorted, I think it was a glue gun or something someone was using, immediately the electricity shut off, which is exactly what it's designed to do. So should it have sparked or should it not have sparked? No one really knows. But it's one of those things that does happen with electricity. When you put, when you put a, a two piece of metal into a plug where, the, where there's electric, it, they, can, they can spark. And you know, in this case, it went further than it normally does. But the systems all worked, the breakers tripped, no one was hurt, and that's exactly what the system designed to do. So, yes, that was just, you know, it, it's not something people should be concerned about. Um, and uh, that was about it. You did talk about the pushmatics. Um, the sides of the music room, those panels on the music room, they're quite likely transite, which would be an, um, possibly an asbestos-based panel. So um, it's not friable. Uh huh? It's not friable. Now, if you're breaking it up, if some kid breaks it a bit more than it is at the moment. Um, but those ones are, but all the same color ones on the big building, they're all steel panels. And there's only, um, so, so, yeah, so that there's the steel ones. How about um, the ones on the outside of the annex here? The, um, I haven't looked at like any, any of this. The same, the same panels as over there, so I don't know if they're the ones like on my room or the ones on the three story. Yeah. Well, you're really special, aren't you? You get the transite panels, you get metal heat. That's why it's here. In a round room. <laughs> In a round room. <laughs> and the trailer's here. <laughs> but yeah, so that was um, that was pretty much all. All the lighting, all the lighting in, in in both schools was changed out to T8, which was you know really good thinking. And of course, T8 barely came in and became obsolete. It was one of those unfortunate moments. Um, you know that it, it it just didn't last, and now now the money's in those. But as they uh, as they die out, then they'll probably get changed over to LEDs. But the T8s are still a big savings over what we had, and they're and they're a good white light. So but that's. If I may jump, that's interesting because uh, I didn't put it in there, but people complain about fluorescent lights in both buildings, feeling like it's loud, it's hot, and it buzzes and it flickers. And you're saying that it's T8, it's not fluorescent? I don't They're know. T8s. No, the fluorescent are T8s. They're yeah. Like yeah. more efficient lamp yeah. than, yeah. okay. than the originals. Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, users re mentioned turning them off and bringing their own lights, which puts a drain on the electric system. Yeah. The, the fixture LEDs can go into the fixture. They can be, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, it's just a matter of rule, uh, light bulb, yeah. bulbs themselves. Yeah. So that was that was my, my quick walkthrough. I, I did a complete walkthrough of the outside of the building on that, but this was the short brief uh, version. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, I do, I, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the shoebox. So I hear what I think you mentioned, short-term, long-term for the shoebox. And I'm wondering what the goal is in our discussions about the uh, modulars and the trailers. Uh, because even, even let's say that the floor plan and the use of the shoebox is great and we have solutions, we still have issues with those with that specific 1998 part that was not supposed to last that long. We've, we've passed its obsolescence here. Uh, I mean, one of the things we noticed is, as everybody's been saying, there's not enough storage space. So if for nothing, no other, if there was no other use that, it, that people wanted to use it for, it's potentially, if you deal with the moisture problem, which sounds like it just wasn't properly well, done to start with. There's bad grading around it. It actually slopes back into the foundation all around. It needs the step flashing over two thirds the length of it, where Jerry was talking there for the foundations out. There's a downspout that comes over by the, by the back doors coming across from, like the back doors of the courtyard that come out there. And there is, there's a, um, a downspout there that goes off into um, an underground pipe that no one knows where it goes. And maybe it only goes about eight feet and is pouring water into the crawl space of that. That's another option. Right. So, but, but the modular units are not the same as a trailer. No, I mean, I've, a, I've got a neighbor who has, I know it's a home, it's not a, it's not a school, a modular home. That modular home is a house. And it's and, you know it's kept up and it's I don't know how long it's been there probably 30 years and it's a nice looking house still so I do think there's some understanding with the modular units that are 
the fact that they were bricked in, put on a foundation. Um, I don't think we should necessarily be thinking those need to be torn down. It seems like they could they could have some important usefulness in the future, assuming you know we go forward in this direction, um, that they could play you know be a positive asset for the school. So I, I just I would I would hope that. Um, as we move to an MPA that we're going to pay money for, right. that we would listen to an assessment about the the that modular part, and, you know, the McKinney, so that we can make informed decisions rather than say we're absolutely going to keep them. I mean, we all know there there are issues, and and it, so I just I just think there's um, I mean I I've, I've done a little research because I. Because I've been hearing so much negativity about the, you know, the modular units and what what does that really what is that you know they're only supposed to last 20 years or whatever so um, but so I just I'm just trying I'm just saying that they're not the same as the trailer here <laughs> the trailer back here they're not the same kind of a, a a space but anyway we don't need to come to any specifics or conclusions absolutely the MPA is going to be the maintenance plan advisor, assuming we go forward with that, uh, higher will be playing an important role. And, you know, our committee is gathering information, but they're not going to be the paid uh, expert who's going to be doing a much more in depth walk. So, um, which, if there, we do want to talk about the maintenance plan advisor and where that request for proposals are and so on. I'm sure people have more, may have more questions with David and others, but I'm kind of thinking it's 10 till 9, yeah. and maybe we should just move on to hear from Terry about that process. Um, I, um, I put a, a subfolder in the shared drive that says MPA information. Um, we received three bids. This is all public record. Um, I think 24K, 29K, 48K. Mm -hmm. um, so our, our task now is to really develop a timeline um, about how we want to proceed. So I put a proposed, a draft timeline in there based upon um, a conversation I had with Judith this morning. And so um, I'll just kind of briefly review it. So the week of May 16th, I think we can designate a selection committee. So by selection committee, it's really the interview committee for the um, for the MPA. Um, in, the, in the decision point, it's different if you receive 10 proposals, we've received three. So we can interview all of them. We can decide we're only interviewing two. Um, the following week. So you're saying on May 16th is that this? I'm just point? saying sometime that week. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, there we, we should okay. probably identify who's going to be on the selection committee, and and that maybe doesn't even need an in-person meeting. I don't know, but okay. uh, the week of May Sorry. 23rd, um, I put selection committee notifies firms and schedules interviews with each firm on the same day, back to back. Um, the week. The reason I put only that item that week is because that is the last week of school. <laughs> And so it's just a rough week to do anything but maybe schedule some interviews for the following week. Um, so hold the interviews on one day. Um, you know, Mike, I think, had a good suggestion, an hour long, a 30-minute presentation within a 20-minute Q&A. Um, once we do that, they, we have a, I have a draft rubric in there. It's very simple. Um, everybody has edit access, so feel free to add what you want. I mean, I don't, I, I, I feel like particularly Judith and, and Dorothy can um, drive this. Um, once we use the rubric after the interviews and, and make a determination about who we want to send to the board, then we send that to the board, that firm to the board. Um, the week of June 6th, there is a board meeting on June 9th. Um, the board could approve that, uh, that MPA firm. Then the following week, and, and I don't know if I have that right with the schedule for meetings of this group, but um, the uh, MPA could meet with this group and then there could be a dialogue 
um, as services begin. And, and what I have on the bottom here is from the RFP that indicate, it, it indicated specifically in there that the selected MPA would meet several times with this whole committee as well as with the Board of Ed. So that would be the time um, to, as it says, uh, give input, request for refinements, revisions, etc. Uh, before we get to the final assessment. Yeah, I think that sounds really good, uh, personally. And um, I think, um, let's see, what say? Can I recommend just one small tweak? Yeah. I think this is really good. The only thing I would tweak would be the week of May 16th when the, when the uh, committee meets to review the RFPs and make the decision on interviewing, I would also just go ahead that same week and notify, because mm. that gives the firms two weeks advance notice. Sometimes if if we only give them one week notice, you won't have all the people in the room you want to have in Done. the room. Yep. So that would just be Good a idea. tiny tweak. I have a question about the decision on the rubrics. Is that on the schedule? Who, how we come up with the rubrics? So, what's your question? I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> me too, and I'm sorry, it's like six to nine. Um, the Here's decision of the rubrics to, to rank the uh, MPAs. So How that like? that's the selection committee. Okay. This group is too big to hold interviews, gotcha. so it has yeah, to be a yeah. subgroup. So the rubric, um, and, and it's in there, and it's really a simple thing. I think there are eight items, and, and each item is, is given a point. You know, I just took a stab at it. You might say, I don't think that should be rated that high. Um, that's it. Okay. That's it. So, so I mean, that the week of the 16th, we can designate the selection committee, finalize the rubric, okay. and then, and, and then we notify can, the selected okay. committees. And we can identify specific questions that we might want to ask to each one. Um, I think that's a good idea if we approach each interview in, with the same format. Um, so I didn't create questions yet, but okay. and, and these uh, criteria are straight really out of the uh, RFP. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So um, so are there any questions? Uh, how does this sound to people, Derek? I have a question. I. Uh, as I recall in the RFP, they were uh, asked to submit a, uh, a plan that they've done for other school districts. That's correct. When is that going to be received? You yeah. have It's in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it's I in, didn't see them. It's okay. in the folder. The Here, is it a complete the plan? There's a link, I think. Is it a complete plan? Some of them answer it a little better than others. But each one had a case study. Um, one had a um, at five or six with with hyperlinks to them mm -hmm. that I think you would find There's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think mean, Jerry, that's where that you know, did you provide past experience with examples and references that item in the criteria? You know, if they did yeah. or didn't do it as well as others, I think that's where we could address. Okay, well, that. I need to look deeper because I didn't. So I was maybe, wondering if they yeah. did. Some in I mean, our in our folder here we have that's the 2022 facilities committee meetings here we have the 2022 MPA information and the three uh, bids are here mods EP click on uh, click on four seasons and then scroll to the very very end it'll show you the kind of I think it's the very very last page okay sorry there's lots of pages and I lots and lots of pages mm -hmm. you said the <laughs> yeah they're all like 30 plus well, 24, but. Okay, okay so the, the, they actually did it in a really interesting way. There's one, two, three, four, five, five examples, and there's those links. If you click that blue button, it'll take you to the full report. For each one. For yeah. each one, and it, yeah. it's. That's why they're not obvious. <laughs> okay. The other, I think the other firms had them actually printed and in there. Embedded in the. Gotcha. So um, should, should we designate tonight the, uh, the committee? Is that that's the thing we do on May 16th? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if you have 
you know, so the rubrics are open to be looked to be added. Mm -hmm. to I user. think everybody has, quite honestly, edit access. You know, yeah. it, the good thing about Google Docs is that you can see who makes changes, and if there are questions, you can ask. Um, but I'm certain. Let me just see. Um, in this group, is only Craig Conrad, but I haven't got an email address to get an access um, to. So everybody it right now has commenter access, which means you make a comment and I can make the change, or if somebody wants edit access, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, I think that using comments is great. That way we can see each yeah. other's thoughts on that. I, I would be in favor of that. Okay. And if you feel like you, you get in a document that you don't have access to, just let me know. Um, okay, and then they then once they're chosen, they have uh, they would meet with us. They have now one thing. Oh, what I wanted to say was I think it's really important, um, you know, from the users as well as from the experts that the information we gather that we can share that with them. You know, it's not enough to look at the systems. You got to know how are they functioning. If they're not functioning well, so that information, you know, if we get uh, can get our written documentation, you know, really up to snuff, so it's easy for them to take to us to just hand that to them as one way of getting that information to them. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that that's sort of part of the the um, request for proposals, where they meet with us um, up to three times and they meet with the board. That would be after. Yeah, so after they're selected, and you're talking about like, right. besides looking at the buildings, they would meet with us, right. um, and then before they give us their sort of final product. Yeah. Well, I would see, I mean, I, we're, they're supposed to meet with us three times, right? They can meet with us up to three up times. To three up to three, three times, times. Mm -hmm. okay. So I guess yeah. my point was that, um, you know, if you're trying to evaluate systems and so on, you need to know how they're, how they're functioning. <laughs> so this information that we're gathering um, is going to be important as they're trying to assess things. It's, it's 9 o'clock, I believe. There's one, uh, one more thing that I want to ask you. Oh, you yeah. I'm just being everything I want to Okay. Um, I think that uh, in terms of access to this de depository, I think that we should add the other board members so that they can start looking at the documents that we are compiling. What do you think? Well, one thing Dorothy and I talked about, I said, people are st going to start to get very interested in what we're doing now <laughs> as we're talking about these kind of, this, you know, this stuff is going to get, it, it's going to be in the newspaper, it's going to be reported, the discussion we had tonight, people are going to be coming, paying, starting to pay a lot of attention. Um, and I know there's a lot in that depository, but the public has a right to see this. And so I started to talk with Dorothy about, I think people are going to want to be able to look at the documentation. Now, you know, I know there's, uh, we want to have it put in there in such a way that names aren't associated, uh, especially teachers who make comments, etc. But I think it's going to be hard. I mean, I think it's going to, I think people are going to want to see, you know, what we're talking about. They're going to want to see some of the documentation. So I think we need to think about how we're going to make, you know. So I have a suggestion. Yeah. The first is we do not grant people access to our Google Drive. Okay. We can take things. We and can put them up on the website. We can PDF okay. them. I've already talked to Karina about okay. cool. doing a whole set of, a whole space on the new website for facilities. Okay. Um, because I know you did that before, mm -hmm. and I think Correct. it's been a, it was a great resource for people. I would not put the MPA proposals on there Correct. until after. Yeah, I wanted to correct. That's, that should be a public record until after it's, I wouldn't think. After they're opened? I think I, they're a public record once they're opened. I wondered about that. I'm just not sure they'd want to share all that with each other. Well, right now, and I, and I think, right. I, I think I mean, that's... We don't want to share theirs. No, no, it wouldn't I be fair to you in the firms. Correct. Yeah, right. Have that exposed. Yeah, right. yeah. So, so this then is a, is a real trust piece with this committee because you do have access to see them. Um, you know, we, we live in a strange world where almost everything we do, somebody can come in and say, I want to see this right now. Right now, but 
So this, this is, these are public records, but I think Mike's point is well taken. We have not yet interviewed these folks. We have not yet selected anybody. Um, so, you know, I can pull them out or I can leave them in with the trust piece that these stay here. Can I, can I ask a question? Uh -huh. are, are we discussing that we are going to give those survey results as well? And if that is the case, I would suggest and request that names are obviously taken out, room numbers are taken out because they are identified with a specific teacher. And I would also request that it just is the data and not the actual comments that teachers were doing um, that we asked them to do and we did not tell them that yes. this is something that, because, because some of the comments could be I also wanted, tied to specific teachers. It, that, that's, I wanted to discuss this with you um, because I do think that this committee should have access to the room numbers and the comments, they're important, <laughs> but once yes. we take them out, should we just keep to um, my Why slides? don't we just use your just use your slides? Yes. I think the slides are, are good enough, right? I do, mm -hmm. put, I do I did copy paste some quotes, but I don't think that they're identifiable in the quotes. Yeah. I, I, uh, we will we can look over. Okay, them. Yeah. all right. Yep. But yeah, okay. I think the slides if that's okay with everybody yep. then we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the slides are very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. It kind of brings all these over. Is there anything else to discuss? Oh, next steps, assignments. So, Dorothy, you said that users will be trying to think about prioritizing. I'm trying to think about how to prioritize this. This is, I, I don't have yet a good concept. Um, mm -hmm. I do not know how to prioritize those needs when they all tie together. <laughs> I am a little bit at a loss here on how to do the next step for the users. Um, well, I'll let you struggle with that. With so, talk. so we have to look at the rest of the bill. Yeah, we have more. Yeah, stuff we have more. Yeah. So can we, can we get a little bit more time? And I think Jay wants to interject something. Yeah. With that uh, timeline for selecting the MPA, yeah. we need to schedule a meeting for us for the week of the 16th. Yeah. A night that this committee can get together and decide who the selection committee is going to be, finalize the rubric, and notify the select parties that. I think rather, I don't think we need to meet, honestly. I think to okay. make that selection. I mean, I was assuming you'd speak to the users, you guys would kind of think about who you would like to see, and then you could do the same. Can, can, the can, we, can we can we agree on a, a big format, like uh, how many? Uh, many? We no have, more than five. Well, we can't have, uh, we cannot have a quorum, which is, uh, uh, Terry will be there, Jay will be there, you and I will be there, that's four, so we could theoretically have three more people. Okay, uh, so we let us know the, with, the three people? Yeah, so why don't we talk? Okay, and, do we I think mean, that seven is not too many for our interviews? Okay, so, all right, seven, seven and three more. Did you? <laughs> oh, not so we can add three more. Okay, okay, we'll talk then. Yeah, so we'll okay. talk and... So, we'll so when is the next meeting, though? So the next meeting will be the first uh, Thursday of the next month. Which is which the is second. Is okay. It's the second. Yeah, it's very quick. June, June 2nd. Okay, June 2nd, 7 p.m. here. Yeah. Any, anything else? I have a question. Yeah, um, We've talked about the uh, about the MTA. I was curious when Mike uh, thought he would be getting involved from an architectural perspective. Well, I think I think the what I'm doing from an architectural perspective is still kind of to be determined in terms so of plan, in terms of planning work. I, right. Well, I, when would you when would you anticipate? From what we've been discussing, like for, I'll just throw out some for examples. Let's say, for example, the committee says they want to consider replacing the McKinney classrooms, keeping it maybe for non-educational use, but replacing it with classrooms. Maybe consider adding a band room or a tornado shelter or something. How could we do that? Where might that go on the campus, and how much would it cost? I can help with that. I'm just not, I'm not sure when we're going to be at that point. Or if it seems to me like when the MPA tells us, can tell us more about 
uh, the systems and the buildings um, and the potentialities for improving them, upgrading them, or not, then we'll have a better sense of what the current uh, footprint is not going to the needs that it's not going to need, or where there needs to be deeper renovation as well as new construction. Yes. So I, to me, once we hear from, start to get the, even that first uh, report from the MPA, we're going to start to see certain things are not going to be met here, certain needs are not going to be met, uh, even with a, you know, mate with a maintenance plan that's going to bring things, upgrade things to, to function well. Does that make sense? It does to me. That, that, that's prior to the final report of the MPA. Well, you can start to think about it. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I, there, there's been a lot of thought already done, so it, some of it isn't going to be um, starting from, from zero. For example, the 2018 plan had a band room tornado shelter with an office addition that provided a secure vestibule. That's all been conceptually considered before, so um, I think that's going to help. Things move a little, a little quicker, and I just don't want to presuppose what's going to happen. Yeah, I would just trying to get a feel for you know the progression of, from the MTA to yep. conceptual designs, and you know when when that might happen. I would think uh, late summer, early fall. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody. I hope. Uh, uh, and change. Yeah. How are you? And uh, for you guys who are still teaching and leading in the schools, um, have a good lunch.